Good afternoon, everyone. This is our briefing on looking for signs of life in the universe. And here to discuss that topic is Mary Wojtek, the director of the astrobiology program at NASA headquarters in Washington, Pan Conrad, the deputy principal investigator for the sample analysis at Mars on the Mars Science Laboratory mission from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. Jamie Foster, professor for the Department of Microbiology and Cell Science at the University of Florida in Gainesville. Steve Brenner, director for the Foundation of Applied Molecular Evolution in Gainesville. And Catherine Conley, I'm sorry, uh, Stephen Benner, director of, for the Foundation for Applied Molecular Evolution. We got Steve and then Catherine Connolly, Planetary mm -hmm. Protection Officer from NASA headquarters in Washington. Mm -hmm. So we'll begin first with Mary Wojtek. Thank you, George. So I'm Mary Wojtek. I'm the head of the astrobiology program. And when discussing looking for signs of life, we need to talk about a program in NASA that's invested over 40 years in research and analysis programs to understand some fundamental questions as we try to approach looking at the distribution of life in the universe. And if I could please, ha please have the first slide. So this is an artist's rendition of what uh, that program encompasses from prebiotic chemistry to understanding how life originated to how it evolved and how it persists on Earth and what's the possibility of finding it elsewhere. And it basically answers three fundamental questions. Where have we come from? That's the origin of evolution. Where are we going? That's our future on this planet. And are we alone in, in the universe? So is there life elsewhere? Now I mentioned that we've been at this for over 40 years. The exobiology program, which was the precursor to the astrobiology program, started in the 60s with research and analysis that provided the conceptions and rationale for over 12 missions that we have uh, launched since that time uh, in understanding uh, what life needs to exist and what are the environmental conditions that will, will favor life. Now one of our prime targets has been Mars and that's what we're here for this week to talk about yet another step in our uh, search to understand the possibility of life on Mars. We've sent landers in the 70s, the Viking missions, to do experiments looking for evidence of metabolism and evidence of life. We've made uh, orbital observations and deployed other rovers that have given us evidence of minerals that suggest that water was present uh, and features that we can see on the surface like deltas and rivers and ripples that are consistent with what we understand are the actions of water on our own planet and so we suspect that's what's going on there as well. And evidence of uh, ice not only at the poles, but in the subsurface away from the poles. And now we're here today, or uh, this week, to talk about MSL, which is the next step, which is defining habitability. So one of the ingredients of life is water. We're now looking to see if we can find other conditions that are necessary for life by defining habitability, or what does it take in the environment to support life. Thank you, George. All right, thanks, Mary. Now to Pan Conrad, the Deputy Principal Investigator for the Sample Analysis at Mars from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Pan. So you're not supposed to do this when you sit in swivel chairs in a press conference, but I'm so antsy <laughs> and so excited that we're finally here getting ready to launch because we've been working on this a really long time. And one reason why it's especially exciting to me is my primary research interest is in what makes places habitable. And I think that astrobiology, as a very broad science, has room for all kinds of questions about life in the universe. But this is, to me, one of the most exciting. Because we have the example of Earth and the example of Mars, who were formed at the same time, and they look very differently today. And everything we know about life and what makes a livable environment on this planet is peculiar to this planet. So it's going to be a tough science question to ask and answer on Mars because what things look like on Mars are a function not only of the initial set of ingredients that Mars had when it was made, but the processes that have affected Mars. So I want to give you a couple of short examples of things that we might look at to try to understand the background environment and what might make it, or maybe not, habitable, and the reason why it's so important to study the environment. 
I'm going to show you a couple of rocks. Now on Earth, what we really try to look for when we go into an environment to assess its potential for habitability, both in the present or perhaps tra trapped in the rock record, are some kinds of structures and chemistry that would tell you that that rock had had a process acted upon it that would leave it in a, a certain way that might make it favorable for life. The processes that rework the surface of the Earth, they're called sedimentary processes, and some of the clues are in this rock. So it looks kind of striped, much like a cake, I might add. And what that means is that one layer of sediment got deposited and then conditions changed just a little bit and you have a distinct boundary between the next episode of deposition of sediment. And after this stuff got heated and smooshed together and became a rock, you ended up with these stripes, which are basically a sedimentary structure, and they give you the clue that it is a sedimentary rock. In other words, a rock that has evolved on the surface from all kinds of processes. The reason we care about this with respect to Mars is because we want to know how dynamic the surface is or is not. It's extremely important to remember that all the life on Earth is a function of, well, all the stuff on Earth, and that we are little bits of Earth. So if a biosphere has ever evolved on Mars, that life would be a function of that environment. We can't say with any definitive knowledge that we could recognize life somewhere else in the solar system or beyond the solar system without being able to unbolt all the assumptions and the experience we have with looking at Earth life. We have to remember that any life that exists somewhere else will be a function of that environment. So Mars Science Laboratory is off to study that environment. We're going to learn about the processes, those things that might make it dynamic, we're going to look at some chemicals that might be consistent with sedimentary mineralogy that would tell us something about how much water activity there's been, what other types of processes might have affected those rocks, and that helps us reconstruct the history of the surface environment so that we begin to get a feel, once again, for process. This rock that I'm holding is a sedimentary rock that is the type that gets precipitated directly from water. So when we say, oh, we find evidence of water on Mars, we're not just talking any, any specific meaning. This is a river. This is a place where there was a standing basin. We're also talking the kinds of minerals that trap the chemical evidence that water has been there. So this type of rock, which is sedimentary minerals, it's, it's a carbonate rock, has this kind of mineral because of sedimentary processes. Now, if this sounds like so much chemistry and physics and geology to you, and where's the life in that, there's a lot of life in that. Once again, because we are the stuff of the place where we're born. And if there has ever been a biosphere on Mars, or on any other celestial object for that matter, it's going to exhibit the characteristics of those environments. So with the very diverse set of experiments with which curiosity is equipped, we're going to go to Mars and we're going to study all kinds of sedimentary evidence for the processes that have affected the surface of Mars. And hopefully we'll walk away with a lot more information about what environments look like on the surface of Mars. I like to say it's extraterrestrial real estate appraisal. So sometime next August, uh, let's see, yeah, sometime next August, early August, we should land in Gale Crater and we'll have an opportunity to size up the environment. And the next time you come back, hopefully you'll be hearing a lot more about the potential for habitability on the surface of Mars. George? Thank you, Pan. Next, Jamie Foster, professor for the Department of Microbiology and Cell Science at the University of Florida. Jamie. Thank you, George. I'm an astrobiologist with the University of Florida, and I work on a type of community called microbialites. And these are microbial communities that are important analogs for us to understand how life evolved on the planet. And so we specifically uh, look at these modern microbialites as examples of looking into the past with a hope that we can try to reconstruct the ancient environment and improve our understanding of the fossil record and to uh, get at the basic ingredients of what's required for life to form and evolve, a major component of astrobiology. So what are microbialites? If I could have the first slide. So as you can see, a few examples of what living microbialites look like. They're very large, and they're found in several places across the globe. 
And microbes, as you can see in the upper right-hand corner of the slide, are dominating these communities. And these microbes take carbon dioxide from the environment and they sequester it as minerals such as calcium carbonate. And I have an example here of an example of that deposition of that calcium carbonate. And what these microbes do is they leave behind these geological, what we call biosignatures, or the residuals of life. And so by studying the, the composition of these minerals, how these minerals are laid out in structure, we can get an understanding of the type of microbes that made these structures. So we can look at them macroscopically or microscopically. And then again, as I to reiterate, we can reconstruct the paleo environment and help us understand how life came to be on the planet. So how does this relate to the Mars Science Laboratory? Well, Mars has a very well-preserved environmental history. And if we can understand the environmental parameters or the biological potential of how life might have formed on Mars, we can correlate that with our studies of modern examples of past life here on Earth. So we can kind of dovetail in the results of understanding this biological potential on Mars and correlate it with the metabolic potential of the organisms that require to form these biosignatures and really get at one of the more major uh, questions associated with astrobiology is how did we come to be and, and how did life evolve on the planet? George? Thank you, Jamie. And now to Stephen Benner, Director for the Foundation for Applied Molecular Evolution in Gainesville. Thank you, George. One of our jobs, of course, is to help you folks explain to your um, readers and listeners uh, what the chemistry is that goes on behind this. Is one of the comments that has been made already is that we're going to be looking for morphology, things in rocks that lead us to say, ah, life was there once or life could be there with the water deposited rocks that you heard about a moment ago. Um, I brought a bunch of toys also. Let me just put a few of them up here just to show you uh, what we usually do when we teach to students. Um, uh, let's see, that's going to be there. <laughs> but the bottom line is that there's a rock, okay, there's a something that looks like a sample of life. There's a rock that contains something that looks like a sample of life here as well. Here's a rock that looks like um, it might be a sample of life as well. And here are some rocks that look like they might be samples of life as well. Now, what's the problem? The problem is that some of these rocks that look like they're supposed to be samples of life are in fact not. So this is, for example, not life actually at all. This actually is not life at all either. This is a, a mineral uh, formation that occurs without biological inf influence. This, of course, for those of you who have uh, frequented the marvelous beaches off the shores of Florida, um, this is actually a coral sample, not taken not from far from here. And of course, this happens to be a piece of coprolite. It's called dinosaur poop. It's a fossilized poop. But one of the things that you have to understand is how difficult it is to look at rocks of this kind and come up to the conclusion whether there's life or not. And for this reason, a lot of what ends up being discussed, and you'll see this in some of the other press conferences here with the chem men, is chemistry. And uh, chemistry is often hard to uh, explain, but let me just use one word. We're going to talk about one thing only in chemistry, and that's oxidation. You hear a lot about that in the discussions of Mars's surface, and you'll hear a lot of it when the, the rovers start sending back their data. Um, the uh, uh, oxidation, oxidizing, oxygen, this is uh, water, a very simple uh, molecule, one oxygen, two hydrogens, H2O, two hydrogens, one oxygen. Um, and of course, oxygen is everywhere. It's, it's in this glass, it's all, uh, all around us. It's believed to be a center for life. And one of the reasons why we're going to Gale Crater is because there's some evidence for recent water there. The difficulty, however, comes when ultraviolet light hits Mars. It's very important that future astronauts protect themselves from ultraviolet light because it's dangerous to the eyes. And of course, you go outside in the sun of Florida, you'll see that. What happens, however, is that when ultraviolet light hits water, it breaks apart the bonds. And what then happens is if this happens often enough, you end up having two hydrogens. They recombine to give H2, two atoms of hydrogen, one. And this is very light. You can fill balloons with it. They'll sail away. It leaves the atmosphere. And what's left behind is two OHs. And they can form H2O2, which is called hydrogen peroxide. This is an oxidant. In fact, it's a well-known oxidant in the sense that you can buy it in your grocery store. And the reason why this is a, 
important thing in your drugstore or grocery stores because it's a sterilant. It actually sterilizes things. And one of the problems that we're going to have on Mars is that, well, it's a problem and an opportunity, is that if you take this oxygen and, you know, uh, hydrogen peroxide and put it in things, what will happen over time is that this particular material will evolve to give off oxygen and oxidize things as you're going to see the bubbles coming out or oxygen that are being generated. That tends to destroy organic material. And what we're looking for on Mars is evidence of the possibility of organic material stabilized. So that's going to be a problem, but it's also an opportunity because one of the other things that was found near the Martian pole is this sample here. This is potassium perchlorate. This is a species that can also give oxygen. Now it's bad because it will destroy organic material which might be there left over from life on Mars or even from Mars extant. <laughs> But, of course, if you're an astronaut and you go to Mars and you want to breathe, right, there's oxygen actually present on Mars that you could actually recover from the surface and actually use. So the one thing first about structure is it's sometimes very deceptive, and you'll see large amounts of discussion going on, just like happened with Alan Hills many, oh, maybe 15 uh, years ago, what structures indicate Mars. And we need people who are sitting mostly to my right and to my left to interpret this as but the second thing we want to warn you about is there's a lot of oxygen on Mars, oxidants on Mars. They're going to be destroying the chemical signatures that might be relied upon for life. Um, uh, that might be bad for our looking at the life detection things in future missions. It will be, however, good if you're uh, a Martian uh, astronaut because, as you can see, you can actually generate oxygen from things that we actually think are on the surface of Mars and use them to breathe and maybe even go breathe while we're there. Back to you, George. Thanks, Steve. And our last presentation from Catherine Connolly, the Planetary Protection Officer from NASA Headquarters. Catherine. Thank you, George. Yes, are we alone is such a sad question. It implies that you know we're all just hovered here, cuddled down here in our single little planet. What we really want to know is, is there anybody out there? It's a much more forward-looking and broad-looking. We might have all kinds of friends. Um, the challenge to doing this, as has been alluded to previously, is that we know there's lots of life on Earth. There's many microbes on your fingers. There's life everywhere. If I touch the surface of something, I leave microbes from my skin on that surface. So um, the, we also have the kinds of microbes that construct this, the structures that Jamie studies. There are lots of microbes on Earth, as well as a small number of big organisms. Um, there are also organisms on Earth that consider us to be food. So there's good organisms neutral organisms and also bad organisms. The point of planetary protection is to make sure that when we go to other places, we don't cause problems or have problems caused by the interaction of those other places with Earth and Earth life in particular. If we're going to go to Mars to look for life, it would be really embarrassing if we found Earth life when we got there. Um, the way we do this is by being very careful when we send spacecraft to other planets that we don't bring Earth life with the spacecraft that then can contaminate those locations, and also that when we bring samples back from other locations that we don't bring back hazardous organisms or other nasty things when the samples come back. Now, it was alluded to the whole process of Mars exploration. We have sent life detection instruments to Mars. This was on the Viking spacecraft. The Viking spacecraft took very great care to make sure there was no Earth life on those spacecraft when they were sent to Mars. And the one thing that we really very clearly learned from Viking is that sending life detection experiments to another planet is really hard. <laughs> Steve mentioned why it might be hard. There's all these different chemical aspects. Understanding what you see, th that you have seen life when it's right in front of you or recognizing that something isn't life when you think it might be is a really difficult challenge. So in the future, the Mars programs and the international Mars community would like to bring samples back to Earth so that we can study those samples in our best laboratories and we look for life with the best tools we have available. When we do that, planetary protection will be taking great care that we don't bring nasty things back to Earth and release the Andromeda strain in public. We don't want to do that. But for um, missions like MSL, the constraint is then bringing, l making sure that that mission doesn't take living organisms to Mars. It's not a life detection mission. It's not bringing samples back. So the only constraint on MSL is to prevent life from Earth getting to Mars and potentially contaminating that location. And so for MSL, the real consideration was that they have to build the spacecraft to be very clean. So when they were 
putting the pieces of the spacecraft together, they got washed with alcohol. All of the people who were touching the spacecraft hardware were wearing these bunny suits, gowns, had their gloves, and being very careful not to send contamination to Mars. And that was an extremely successful effort. The MSL is the cleanest spacecraft that we will send to Mars since Viking. And so I think we're all looking forward to a very successful mission. Thank you, Thanks, George. Thanks, Catherine. And for some concluding remarks now, back to Mara Wojtek from NASA headquarters. Thank you. So we're here today discussing looking for signs of life. The game is afoot, the search is on, and MSL is taking a very important step, and, and part of it is developing a strategy for narrowing that search. It's going to look for places that are habitable, either in the past or potentially even in the future or, or currently. It's doing a real estate assessment. Where are those good schools on Mars? Where might there be microbes living or, or some type of life? But you've also heard here, in addition to strategies and what we understand about life on Earth, the challenges that it's going to pose was, as we move into the future to actually look for life. We know that things that we know about life on Earth sometimes deceive us ourselves. Shapes that we know look familiar and could be coral actually are a rock formation that forms the same way. That crystal that Steve showed was, uh, looked very much like a fern, but actually is a crystal. So there's going to be a challenge in recognizing it, even if it ends up being just like life as we know it here. And then there's the whole question of what if it isn't life like we know it on Earth. It's, it uses different materials, it forms different structures. That's also going to be a challenge. And then there's the issue of making sure, as Cassie's gone into detail, that we go on and when, as we go and we look for life, we don't take it there with us and then misidentify ourselves as inhabiting a particular location. And I want to just flip through a few slides at the end to talk about the targets. Here, of course, is where MSL is going. Um, our favorite neighbor, our first real estate assessment uh, on Mars. And then the next slide, three other very important bodies in our solar system, the icy moons of Saturn and, and Jupiter. Um, we have in, uh, Europa, Enceladus, and Titan. And then the final, it, this is an artist's rendition of an extra exoplanet or an extrasolar planet. This is a, a, pic, um, a depiction of a planet orbiting another star besides our own. And this is also some place that we're considering life outside uh, our own solar system. So thank you very much for joining us today. We've introduced you into, I hope, uh, uh, the role of astrobiology in strategizing and coming up with a, a rationale for this, our search. And you can see that we're looking forward to our future missions. Thank you, Mary. We're ready now to take questions. Please give your name and affiliation when the microphone comes to you. Marsha. Um, Marsha Dunn, Associated Press for Dr. Conrad. Um, do you expect a, a eureka moment in anything that you could possibly get back in your findings? And granted, you're not a life detecting instrument, but is it conceivable that if you got really, really lucky, you might be able to identify it if it's there? I, I think the fear of every scientist is that the eureka moment might come and you wouldn't have noticed. And so the, the search for life and also the specific investigation that Mars Science Laboratory will be conducting are part of a larger architecture, a strategy that we hope will lead us to inferences that will be wonderful for years to come. But again, they're part of a whole architecture of a structured research program, the first part of which is to understand the environment so that we know the background of chemistry, of shapes, of other kinds of environmental indicators that tell us what the Martian environment is really like so that if we see something that we know is certainly not a mineral and we see something and it doesn't look like the atmosphere, we can say, okay, these are materials that we need to understand better. So do we anticipate that we'll learn a whole lot about Mars? Absolutely. Uh, do we know what specifically that will be? No clue. But we will learn more than we presently know about the Martian environment, and that should tell us not only something in specific about that environment and those processes on Mars, but will help inform us a little bit about the variety of processes in chemistry that exist in the solar system, because the only thing we know about biospheres is based upon the one we live in. So eureka moment? Don't know. Sure hope so. This uh, Chris Haber, uh, United Television and Radio. Uh, the first question I was wondering 
um, with the recent discovery of liquid water on Europa, what is, uh, are you guys planning something for Europa yet? And uh, secondly, um, uh, if, you, if you're looking for uh, any carbon-based, uh, possibly anaerobic uh, microbials, or if we even have any ideas how to look for other possible life forms that wouldn't be carbon-based. So um, I can take that first question about Europa, and let me just clarify. Um, we've known for over a decade that there was water on Europa. Um, the key finding that was just reported last week in Nature was a mechanism by which the oxidants that are formed on the surface and the reductance of the core of Europa can actually uh, be in communication and possibly connect as a battery would uh, a flow of energy that could fuel an ecosystem. So that's checking off a second box as we consider the possibility of habitability on those icy planets. So we already knew about water, but that um, subsurface lake provides a conduit. Uh, are we interested in it? As I'm sure you all know, the decadal survey that was recently delivered in the spring identified two very important questions as top priorities. Uh, for flagship missions. One was Mars sample return and the other was exploring uh, the Jupiter Europa system. And so are we interested in it? Absolutely. Um, does this uh, encourage us that it's a good target to consider? Absolutely. Uh, and we're considering it and continuing studies because this is not the only decade we hope we see in exploration. There are many more to come and other targets to, to investigate. I guess I'll comment about the carbon-based life, et cetera. One of the really cool things about chemistry and what we've been able to observe throughout the universe is minerals are minerals, and we see some of the same kinds of minerals we would expect on Earth in meteor samples of parent bodies, of, that is, of other planets and moons, asteroids, and so forth. And we also see organic molecules in other places. And so what we want to understand within one environment as opposed to another environment is what does the specific collection of minerals and possibly other types of chemical reactions that occur tell us about the potential to have more complicated things going on, like the way you would need if you were going to be life? Whether we expect life to be made of this or that in one environment in the solar system as opposed to another is, is really more the kind of question you ask a writer. What would you speculate on is the stuff of you know, fun and conjecture. When you try to do an experiment for something as important as determining whether or not you understand an environment or whether or not you think there may be life elsewhere in the universe, you have to completely cleanse yourself of assumptions about what you know of life here and think at a more fundamental level, what do you know about chemistry? And so one really important thing that I think we should always keep in mind is we're trying to not have expectations. But that being said, I want to go back to what we're really going to do on Mars Science Laboratory, which is not go on a survey looking for all of the organisms, much like we did on Galapagos many, many, many years ago on Earth. We're going to Mars to try to understand an environment. And as we go there, we'll learn lots about the chemistry of that environment. And that should help us begin to have new ideas that are not so Earth-centric. One last word on that. NASA, NASA did team up with uh, National Research Council and National Academy of Sciences, and in 2004 published a book, which I co-authored with John Barris, who's a professor at University of Washington in Seattle, looking for the limits of organic life in the solar system. It was called the Weird Life Report. If you give me your card afterwards, I'll see that you can get a copy. Um, basically, if you look at us as sort of the model, Right, and you start saying, how could we be different from us? The first thing we would do is get away from the 20 amino acids that you, you know, have in the health food store, maybe not lysine, maybe not methionine, maybe something else. The second thing we would do is maybe change the DNA structures that we have. So if you listen to the movie E.T., you will notice that E.T. has six letters in his DNA alphabet, not four, like we have. Then the next thing we might worry about is going to a solvent other than water, so very much so in Titan, where the surface of Titan is a hydrocarbon ocean propane, um, 100 degrees Kelvin, cold. Um, and then, and then, and only then, do we get away from carbon in our sort of hierarchy of possibilities. So, you know, as Pan says, we don't <laughs> want to have a lot of preconceptions. We want to consider that if, you know, uh, Tim Allen, you know, 
Galaxy Quest alien rock creature comes up and bangs us on the head, we don't want to ignore it. That would be the aha moment that we would <laughs> regret having missed. But that's relatively long way down in our, our what-if scenarios. And you can read that in this report, which I'll be happy to get a copy to you. Question over here. Oh yeah, hi, Mike Wall from space.com. I mean, one of the things that Sam is actually going to look for is actually, I mean, carbon-containing stuff. I mean, I was just hoping you guys could could just go into a little detail. Do you expect there to to actually be, I mean, carbon compounds on the surface, and is it going to be tough to find? I mean, if it is there in small concentrations. Well, uh, the good news is that following this briefing, there's going to be another briefing, and the principal investigator of Sam, Paul Mahaffey, will be able to address this in more detail, but just to sort of briefly answer your question, uh, we know there are carbon compounds on Mars because the atmosphere has carbon dioxide. And one of the reasons why carbon is so important to us is because it has a form that's sort of oxidized, which is the carbon dioxide, and then there are the more reduced forms that make organic molecules. One reason why we want to understand what kind of chemistry you can do on Mars is because minerals make the same kind of bonds all the time. They're mostly what we call ionic bonds and they form certain crystal shapes and then occasionally you have water incorporated into the minerals and that could be a hydrogen bond. But carbon is special because of the types of chemical bonds it makes and it, it is something that we would want to understand the sources and sinks for it on Mars and so we, we anticipate learning a lot about carbon. Whether or not we will see carbon mostly as oxidized or mostly as reduced forms, we don't know yet. But Sam is designed to look for that, and as I said, uh, Paul Mahaffey will talk a lot more about that shortly. And there is also the question, of course, uh, plastics have carbon in them, and we know the spacecraft is carrying plastic, so there still is the constraint of being able to understand what we brought with us versus what we're seeing that's actually there. Let me just add one comment to that. I mean, as I mentioned, and as the oxygen is spilling over in the room, right, <laughs> Mars has the ability to oxidize the organic molecules that we know come to Mars by meteorites. Come, They fall on Mars. They contain carbon. Um, there is this specimen, which is an example of carbon that's still not carbon dioxide. It's relatively highly oxidized, but it's fairly stable. And if I weren't sitting in a carpeted room, I'd strike a match and show you how stable that is to further oxidation. So some of us have a $5 bet on this being an organic molecule that would be found on Mars because it's a endpoint of the oxidation that we believe it occurs, but not so much of an endpoint that it gets all the way to gaseous carbon dioxide. So yeah, I mean, we're desperate to find stuff on Mars. There are things on that um, science laboratory which have the capability of finding organic materials on Mars. Um, and if we can find them, that's going to be a big strike for habitability in the place where we looked. Ken? Uh, hi, Ken Bill with the Space Flight Magazine for, for Pan uh, and anyone else. Um, maybe a little repetitive, but I, I wonder if you could give us a few examples of how uh, Sam is going to operate and then look at those rocks and looking for signs of life and, and, and the ingredients of life. And what have you done to take into account what, what Steve Benner, Benner mentioned about the oxidation that we discovered with the Viking and the, and, uh, and, uh, and the Phoenix with the perchlorates and the peroxide? What, what have you done on, on Sam to determine that, whether they are there and how you'll account for that? Thanks. So uh, for those of you uh, that don't have the background on this, so the sample analysis at Mars or, or SAM instrument suite uh, is equipped with the ability to ingest um, solid samples, powders of rock, uh, as well as the ability to breathe the Martian atmosphere indirectly. And so the reason why we're so interested in understanding the chemistry of Mars uh, goes back to what I was saying earlier and several of us have said, and that is you're basically trying to understand what the environment is there and then figure out what processes have gone on in that environment. And we keep bringing up oxidation and oxidation and reduction. Living things uh, make their business, their commerce is basically the exchange of electrons, buying them and selling them, and that's one reason why we're so interested in oxidation and reduction chemistry. So your question, what is SAM going to do about this? First of all, SAM does not uh, operate alone. Uh, SAM operates within the context of a whole suite of instruments which will 
help us to do a very careful characterization of all the chemistry that we can on Mars. But as we look at rocks that we would call oxidized rocks or those kinds of um, signs of the type of chemistry that S Steve demonstrated that have been oxidized, that tells us something about how chemically reactive those rocks are. If we looked at other rocks, say we found some pyrite or something, that would tell us about another type of chemistry where we would say the rock is in a reduced phase, doesn't have a lot of free oxygen. The point is we want to understand the range of chemistry. So Sam will operate together with other instruments to try to understand what the range of chemistry is by looking at the inventory of chemicals that are in the materials we study, the inventory of chemicals that are breathed in from the Martian atmosphere, and we'll start to get a picture of what the redox potential, as we call it, is on the surface of Mars. Now, a second question that goes with that is, what happens if you get something that's oxidized? That's the reason for this diverse payload, for us all to look at these materials together and arrive at some potential courses of action to determine the next experiment we would do the next day. And ultimately, what we hope we'll learn is enough to ask the best set of questions for the next mission that goes. And as we learn about this diverse chemistry of Mars, we can begin to compare and contrast that with what we know on Earth and what we learn in meteorites and get a better picture of the comparative planetology of our solar system. Does that help? All right, yes, right here. Hi, uh, Mitchell Landsberg, Los Angeles Times. Um, I want to ask a really basic question, which is, why do we care uh, whether there's life on Mars? Is there, you know, is the, they're thinking that there are practical reasons to, to, to learn this? Uh, is it to satisfy our curiosity, or is it a, a, essentially a sort of theological quest? I think you could say all of the above. Uh -huh. When we first sent the Viking missions to the Mars, the Viking missions, a long time ago, we didn't know that there were organisms at the base of the, at the bottom of the ocean in the mid-ocean ridges that were surviving in temperatures and pressures that were completely impossible for humans to tolerate. Hmm. At that point, we also didn't know that there were organisms in the uh, hot springs of Yellowstone that might be able to be used for polymerase chain reaction processes. We didn't even know about DNA, um, Western blots, a lot of the molecular biology that we use today. But those PCR reaction, uh, those, that PCR process, polymerase chain reaction, is widely used in medicine today for diagnostics, for identifying potential for disease in humans. The, I mean, it's the, ec the argument that is made for exploration anywhere. We don't know what we're going to find. If we don't go there, we know we're not going to find it. I, mm -hmm. I would also say that this is a fundamental question that was posed 500 BC by some of the atomists. So Daedalus wondered, uh, looking out into the skies, you know, that the idea that there would be life nowhere else in the universe was as, uh, as ridiculous to him as thinking you would sow a fertile field and get only one thing to, to grow. So they were thinking this 500 BC. So this is not a construct of, of our century or the last century. This is something fundamental, of fundamental import importance, I, I believe, to, to humankind. As a non-NASA employee, I'm almost tempted to throw the question back at, at you <laughs> because it, obviously NASA has a customer. It's the American taxpayer, and to some extent it's the world. And if you go to any opening of any Hollywood, what, movie, what is the chance that it will be a movie about aliens? Well, the answer is the, in, the public is interested in this. Second, if you want to talk about the training and enthusing of young students to study science, which everybody seems to agree is important for a modern economy, studying chemistry is hard work. It's not all plastic models, fun and games. And as has been mentioned, right, you go 10 years between aha experiences and the rest of it is drudgery, getting the machines to work and, you know, finding that what you thought was true is wrong way we aspire, and when I go to high schools or elementary schools, if I raise a question about whether there are aliens, life, even microbial, this gets the response that is far more excitement than even if I say, let's cure cancer, right? I mean, this is how we motivate people to study and do the hard work to study science. So I, <laughs> we go, I will almost be tempted, except the fact that this is a press conference in one direction, to throw this question back to you and your editorial staff as to what do you think is an exciting question? if it's not this. Roger Ecker of Arcata High. This question is for Catherine. Um, there are limits set on the number of spores that 
you were allowed to take to Mars. And you said this was the cleanest spacecraft going. I'm wondering what numbers you found in your testing. Well, um, it, was left less, it was about half of what the requirement is. The MSL spacecraft is about the same level of cleanliness on a much larger spacecraft as the MER rovers were. Um, this is d demonstration of the really hard work that the people who were hands-on on the spacecraft did in order to keep it at that level of cleanliness. It also is a demonstration to the international community and the policy setters that we actually can maintain these levels of cleanliness, which is really nice to know on a big spacecraft, because if we do go to Europa, we have requirements that are more stringent for Mars, but the demonstration that we actually can get to this level means that with more work, we can do even better and not only not contaminate Mars, but potentially not contaminate Europa when we're actually going to potentially send a spacecraft into an ocean, or it will get there eventually, even if we don't put it there on purpose. A about about um, 250, 300,000 spores is what the number, and that's just a metric. That isn't the total number of organisms on the spacecraft. It's just a, a, a way that we test to show the level of cleanliness, but it was about half of what the requirement is, what the maximum allowable is. Well, we've got a question on the, uh, on the telephone from Denise Chow from space.com. Denise, ask your question. Well, apparently she's not there anymore. So any additional follow-ups here in the room? All right, in that event, that will include uh, this briefing, a uh, couple of programming notes. There will be the uh, Mars Science Laboratory Mission Science Briefing, which follows uh, this briefing. And uh, then tomorrow at 1 p.m., the pre-launch news conference is scheduled, and uh, that uh, is at that time because the launch readiness review will have just uh, ended a couple of hours uh, before. So uh, please stay tuned now for our Mars Science Laboratory Mission Science Briefing coming up next. Thank you. <laughs>